I am sitting with Dan McCain here on February 7, 2012 in the Delphi Interpretive Center and we're going to talk about the history of not just the canals and transportation mm -hmm. in Delphi but how this got going. Explain briefly what is the Wabash and Erie Canal? The Wabash Neary Canal was linked to the East Coast that put Indiana on the map because, in fact, in the early days, you couldn't bring products and goods and even people out here without water transportation. There certainly weren't any well-developed roads at that time. The canal era in Indiana ran from the 1830s mm -hmm. to 1870s. Started in, in Fort Wayne, 1832, and came west faster than it went at east. So it got to Delphi by 1840, finally got to Evansville by 1853, although it was way too late by that time because the railroads had already gotten in southern Indiana. But more important, go back to 1840 in Delphi, we had to wait three years before it connected to Toledo. Once it got to Toledo, then you could reach the east coast. So literally by 1843, Delphi residents could go all the way to New York City by water we well, can't do that today, but by water, because you had to use a steamer to go across Lake Erie, and you had right. to use a steamer also to go down the Hudson River to get into New York Harbor. All that was possible by water in 1843. And where steamers weren't used, the canals were, and that was basically horsepower or mule power. Yes. So we have a section of the Wabash and Erie Canal rewatered in Delphi that's actually the only public accessible major section of water left in the Wabash and Erie Canal in Indiana. Now, I'll say that and people say, oh, well, what about Metamora? I said, well, that's the Whitewater Canal. That's not the Wabash and Erie. Well, what about downtown Indianapolis? Well, that's the Central Canal. That's not the Wabash and Erie. The Wabash and Erie was the longest canal ever built in the United States and second longest in the world at 468 miles. Now, and that includes part of Ohio. It includes all the way to Toledo. Interesting though, in Ohio, if you're a resident of Ohio, you would say, well, that's the Miami Area Canal. Seven years after it was created and had been originally called the Wabash Area Canal, then people of Ohio didn't even want to help Indiana that much. Well, they renamed it the <laughs> Miami Area Canal. And what is the group that you oversee now? Well, the Wabash and Erie Canal Association that did start in 1971 puts it back a generation before me. So my mother was very involved in the beginning of the Canal Association. It was the first president, and they saw the opportunity to do something with our historic resource that was here wasting away, and yet the majority of the community of Delphi and many other canal towns along the Wabash and Erie Canal didn't like the canal. So your mother had a different idea. Well, she was a school teacher, and maybe she saw it more from environmental and educational benefits. It had a lot of history that otherwise wasn't being discovered much in Delphi. There were a lot of things that we could credit in Delphi as the beginning of a major, might say, metropolitan area of its day. Delphi was really a bustling community. But in fact, uh, now today, we're about the same population as we were when, at the end of the canal period. What did your mother do? Well, she got uh, involved with some of her friends, uh, those about a dozen people that would have a caring for the historic structure of the canal, the, the fact that it came through Delphi. And they would basically st stake their reputation on the fact that this is something we really ought to develop as a resource, as an educational resource, as a recreational resource. But most of the community would tell her or the other people on the board, you're wasting your time. You're never going to make anything out of this. It's going to cost too much. Just forget it. But they wouldn't forget it. They organized, and it took many years before things really began to happen. They had no money at the beginning. They just had a will to do something. In fact, sometimes uh, when I'd come home from my work, I, I was far away. I was in Fort Wayne for most of those years. Uh, I'd ask her, how are you getting along with the Canal Association? What are you getting done? Oh, we've got lots of plans. We're working on land rights. We're doing things to try to develop a better understanding in the community of the significance of the canal. But the biggest decision we made at the last board meeting is whether we could afford to buy a roll of stamps. Now you laugh, you laugh because yes. it sounds funny, but what it said was, 
we have a will to do things. We don't have any money, but we can certainly communicate, and communicating by mail, or we don't have e email at that time. So it was important to realize that they were creating something in our community. She wrote an article in the paper, uh, not always every week, but every other week or so, that helped bring about more of an understanding of the cultural and, and engineering background of what the canal did in this area. How it was built, who were the people, what kind of businesses did it bring, how did it impact our economy. Those are things that finally softened the public to the point where people would say, oh, that really was pretty good for Delphi. That canal really did have an impact on our community. After her doing this, or while she was doing this, what was the next development that occurred? Well, they were, they were attempting to get land rights to be able to reconstruct a section of the canal. There were dreams of being able to develop the canal. There wasn't a thought that there was going to be an introduction of additional water as we have today that comes from the stone quarry. They thought of just dredging it and making it uh, wide and deep again. What? What is the name of the stone quarry? Delphi Lime Co Stone Company. And they donate water? They donate three million gallons of water a day. And it's beautiful, clean, clear water, just like drinking water. So you can see the bottom of the canal, you can see the fish, you can see the turtles. And there's no stink, there's nothing rancid about no it. Mosquitoes <laughs> no mosquitoes even. And that's the biggest difference. When I was a boy, mosquitoes could literally carry you away if you went back by the canal in the summertime. It's beautiful. Why didn't people love it back then? <laughs> it didn't look like that. So, so you began in 80, after 87, you began to take on the role sort of, of what your mother and the association yeah, had done. I was, and, I was still uh, in my career in 87. I worked at Purdue, not for Purdue, but I was at a national center called the Conservation Technology Information Center. I'm an agronomist by training. I'm not a historian. Okay. <laughs> so I became more interested in things every day that I was living here then, and uh, my mother basically wanted to retire from the board by that time, and so I got on the board and, and was a member until I retired in 1994, and then um, have become president since uh, uh, 1999. We've called the Monday, Wednesday, Friday crew uh, since uh, 1997, that's what we started doing, working three days a week for a half a day. So every other day, a half a day, if you're retired, that's not a bad uh, work ethic. And you get together and it's, it's stimulating because it's social as well as me mechanical in terms of getting things done. And we've existed like that now for over 15 years. And, and this group includes several that were originators of that. And they're still active. 2000s, because of what we had begun to accumulate with the uh, initial uh, gift of uh, $100,000 from Mr. Vanskoy, we were able to launch things in a much larger way, including getting transportation enhancement money to be able to build this building we're in, which is a, a 12,000 square foot building, new, looks old, looks mm -hmm. like 1850s on the outside remnant of Delphi downtown in, in that early period. And we were able to put this building and museum together in uh, 2001, two, and open it in 2003. Then other big events that occurred, such as the uh, uh, funding and, and building of our canal boat warehouse and dock, which finally culminated by 2009 with the completion of the waterway experience. And we've got most everything in place. What we're doing today is maybe, to me, even more rewarding. We're taking all the significant interpretive sites along a three mile section of towpath, which is all accessible by trail, and we're putting at individual sites along the trails where there's a lock or, or the old paper mills or the lime kilns or other things that, are, that were significant of that day. Mm -hmm interpretive exhibits, many of which are interactive, and they're exciting, and they're outdoors. So you could use this 365 days a year. So you have people come here and we happen to be closed, and we are actually open in this museum every day of the year with the exception of a couple of uh, holidays. And yet, on the, on the outside, you can use that any day of the year. 
any time other, I mean, from daylight to dusk. Sure. But it's important. It's actually stimulating. We've done some major projects like two res restorations of old historic iron bridges, and we're just ready to start a third one, which is a lot bigger. It's a 160 foot long bridge from down to Greencastle that we'll be starting on in the spring. What's the first of those bridges? First bridge was one that came from Camden. It was an 1873 wrought iron bowstring arch bridge. Beautiful structure. Declared inadequate by the county and, and retired and, and given back to the farmer because they didn't even try to put another bridge in its site. And we were able to discover that bridge and asked the farmer if we could have it. And he looked us over and he decided where we were going to put it. It was a pretty nice spot. So he gave it to us. And that started us then to find a grant and to begin a year-long process of taking that bridge completely apart and putting it back together. 3,500 individual pieces in that bridge. It was wrought iron, 126 years old. And guess how many of the thousand bolts that we took out of it, how many of the thousand bolts we broke? Four. Four. Four <laughs> bolts, because they were wrought iron and not steel. Second bridge was one that came from near Winnemac in Pulaska County. And it's a rare bridge, uh, last one known to exist in the United States, and it was 70 foot, same as the first bridge. And we uh, did that one in, in a period of about a year or a year and a half. So it's significant, and it's on the state register. We wish it was on the national register now, and it lost its, its status when it was moved. It was on the national register. So if it's in this site for 50 years, would that reestablish it as historic yes. landmark? Right. right. You've got several other national register uh, historic landmarks in, on the canal. We have the lime kilns, which were there and active in that period in the 1850s. And uh, we, that's part of our park and trail system. We also have the Lock and Lock Keeper's House, which is on the National Register, and the Irish Construction Camp, which also is very exciting because thinking that there were three to 600 Irishmen working on the canal that lived in this camp for upwards to a year. And that camp was discovered by the archeologists, including where their cook shack was and he determined, as he found the hearth where the cooking had been done, that he thought first he had uncovered a foundation or, or whatever that was small, and he just kept enlarging and enlarging his test site, and he realized that he was in an ash area where this had been used for a long time for that period of the year, and that finally he realized he was into the cook shack hearth. Wow. And that was exciting because it's, it's on the National Register and it's the only documented uh, work camp site in the United States of, 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 a, of a hearth. And a, really? You know, and a canal work camp. So we've got some things that are right beside the trail and we've got interpreting signage and sometimes exhibits and interactive exhibits right out on the trail where you can go out and explore and so your walk becomes very meaningful because you're seeing things that are real. How many members are there of the Wabash and Erie Canal Association right now? Well, we have about 900. 900? Mm -hmm. And how many are on the board? Uh, 27. And how often does the board meet? Monthly. Monthly. We'll have, most board meetings, we will have 20 to 22 people here. Wow. That's... It's fun. That's excellent. It's fun. That you have that much participation. Yeah, it is, it is lots of participation. That's the reason why I continue to tell you, don't focus on just right. a person. They don't come to us as because, because they're an engineer or a bank board president or something like that. That's not why we got them. It's because in their heart, They've got something to offer. Yes. And they're commoners as everybody else is in this system. It isn't a pecking order kind of thing. Right. And you don't want to organize around that. No, you no, don't want no. to have to have, you know, who can dress the best? Who's, who's got the... No, you don't want to do that. that. We've, we've appreciated being able to make it possible for the public 
to enjoy most of our uh, endeavors at no cost. When families come here, this museum, for instance, is no cost to enter. It's free. And you might wonder, well, how, how do we do that? Well, because we have other things, space that we rent in the building for uh, wedding receptions and meetings and meals and re other receptions and all. And that gives us an income to pay the heat and lights and we keep progressing and we don't need the income from the museum. It's free, but we do charge for the canal boat. Mm -hmm. What plans of buildings or what plans does the association tend to want to do in the next five years? Well, we've got one big plan is to put a connector back across the canal uh, with a bridge that will connect us to the County Historical Society has acquired land on the other side of the canal at an area what we call the Stone Barn over there. It's an existing building and they want to build a couple of other buildings. So this uh, bridge will be a connector between our two campuses, which we feel is very important. They're going to focus on transportation, but a little later era than we focus on. And ah, I think that's wonderful. It is. It'll, it'll be the railroads and the interurbans and the It'll be automobiles. symbiotic to show the whole continuum. Yeah. 